Yeah, hello everyone. Um, yes, uh, I want to talk about uh, anonymization of uh, human faces and images and videos. And um, that work is part of a small data reuse project called uh, MumuCorp, which stands for Multimodal Corpora. And uh, yes, I skip the outline. Um, as you know, um, Creating a multimodal corpus uh, requires um, anonymization of auditory, visual, and other data. For text data, you need to anonymize uh, the person names, addresses, phone numbers, etc. That is well known. Audio data, you need to anonymize, anonymize the human voice while trying to keep intact the prosody. And um, you need also to anonymize uh, certain artificial sounds that might be individual ringtones for smartphones, etc. And then Further, um, in the multimodal corpus, you have video data, and um, that uh, contains uh, very sensitive biometri biometric data, like uh, face uh, data, um, the iris, maybe gait patterns, the body shape, maybe tattoos, or maybe special clothing. And um, also, there might be biophysiological data, like EEG, EKG, and so on. I just want to talk today about uh, anonymizing human faces. And um, the goal is that participants of a study um, that make up such a corpus should not be re-identifiable by either humans nor by computer algorithms. You can see a sample frame from the corpus, and um, that corpus is about uh, human-robot interactions. And uh, you can see that we um, have bounding boxes around the faces and uh, that we also have tracked the uh, body posture. And the reason for that is that uh, sometimes uh, some humans uh, face away from the camera and um, in such situations the face detection algorithm actually might fail. And, uh, but if you have a body posture with another um, a detector, you can estimate the head region and then at least give a um, coarse bounding box around that, uh, around the head position and blur everything just to be on the safe side. Because here, in that situation, uh, it's most important to um, keep the privacy of the participants. Yeah, face detectors um, um, face some challenges. And um, first challenge might be a high number of faces that can be found in images. There might be a few faces, but there might also be, like in this audience here, a lot of faces. And um, yeah, that uh, face detector has to deal with that. Um, Next, we might have blurry faces. Imagine you have a camera that is moving quickly, then you might have motion blur, and a good face detector should deal with that. Further, we might have strong differences in illumination. Um, you might have uh, faces or humans that sit in a dark spot, like uh, up there, and you might then have also like properly lit faces. That uh, a detector has to deal with these strong differences in illumination that might occur. Further, we might have uh, faces in unusual poses, like with strongly tilted heads, or even upside down faces. And we might also have uh, partially occluded faces. You might look at these wonderful glass windows, you might find uh, some faces that are covered by hands and so on. That uh, is still showing uh, or leaving intact some parts of the face, so that face should definitely be detected and uh, anonymized. Yes, then we also can have reflections and uh, we can also have strong makeup that might disturb face detectors. So, very brief history of the evolution of machine learn learning based face detectors. In 2004, we have hard cascades and uh, these early face detectors had problems with faces that are um, filmed from the side or photographed from the side and also had difficulties uh, detecting faces that were partially occluded and on top also produce many false positive protections. Then uh, 2016 MTCNN uh, was a deep learning based um, face detector. Uh, it was a huge improvement over hard cascades uh, in precision compared to hard cascades. 2019 um, an even better face detector came around uh, called dual shot face detector that showed a clear improvement over MTCNN and in 2020 um, openly available uh, another face detector, retina face. That is faster than the dual shot face detector and has a slightly better precision than DSDF. 
As you can see, phase detectors uh, are approaching kind of a saturation, and the two phase detectors we evaluated, the DSDF and retina phase, are among the best ones. At least there's a saturation on that uh, data set. Here's just a slide to show that um, for situations where a person is uh, showing your back, uh, and still maybe the ear might be visible, um, we fall back to um, post detection and use that post detection to estimate the head region. And for that, we use the um, uh, machine learning model called YOLO version 7 uh, that is able to detect the human pose. Then to test the quality of the face detectors and uh, the combined approach of combining face detection with post detection, we um, created a small data set um, with hand-selected images from our videos. And um, these videos were, um, uh, were, were difficult. Um, oh, let me say it again. Um, we selected specifically frames with um, humans that are in difficult to detect situations, like partially occlude, uh, occluded or persons that overlap if each other or persons in unusual poses and so on. And uh, with that, we could nicely test the quality of these face detectors. And for uh, evaluation, let me briefly talk about some uh, uh, things here. Um, imagine you have a ground truth bounding box here in that face and the black one. And um, imagine you have a face detector that is not that good and um, creates a bounding box um, that is not properly aligned with the face. Uh, that is shown in magenta. Then you can define areas. And uh, one area is the area of false negative pixels, shown in red. So that is um, areas where actually is a, where there is a face uh, present, but uh, the face detector and its bounding box doesn't cover that area. Then you have a green area that is uh, the area of false positive uh, pixels. That is an area where, is, where no phase is. And uh, then finally in blue, you have the two positive pixels that is uh, where the detector actually really overlaps with the phase. And you can imagine which situation is uh, bad for anonymization. And that is actually if you have uh, a lot of false negative pixels. So that is to be avoided, while if you have an area detected with um, false positives, that is not a big issue, um, as, as long as uh, the number of false positive uh, pixels is uh, not that great. I will skip that. So um, all of these uh, face detectors have essentially two very important parameters. That is first the confidence threshold and second the non-maximum suppression threshold. And you have to adjust these uh, parameters to find a good um, outcome. Um, and especially for the task of anonymization, you need to choose different parameters than you would choose for like um, precise phase detection, where you want to have a precisely aligned bounding box. Because for anonymization tasks, as I said already, the cost of a missed phase detection, a false negative, is much higher than a false positive detection. And uh, specifically, we found that um, the threshold, confidence threshold parameter should be as low as possible. If you make it too low, you might end up in a situation where you have a lot of uh, false positive detections, where the detector sees faces everywhere, and then you could just blur the whole video, so you wouldn't um, it, yeah, you wouldn't achieve anything. But if you go close to this um, uh, limit, then you can have uh, mostly, almost every face detected in an image or in video. And uh, that means that you have very little uh, manual annotation effort later on. Second uh, parameter is uh, non-maximum suppression. That is a, um, um, a thing with um, machine learning based uh, face detectors that we produce a lot of bounding boxes and um, that are um, like spread around the face. And with non-maximum suppression, you can find the best bounding box that um, best matches the face. But it turns out uh, with our experiments that we actually want to keep main, some of these bounding boxes because that improves um, the um, or reduce, um, reduces the number of false um, negative pixels. Here you can see that visualized, um, 
From left to right, um, we have a confidence of uh, 0.95, and you can see that only two phases actually are detected because we have a very high confidence threshold. So the detector needs to be very confident that there actually is a phase. Then if we lower that value, um, look at B, you have a confidence of 0.75 and so on, and uh, it gets smaller uh, if you go to image C. Then a lot of phase, uh, or all phases are detected, but you start to see um, several bounding boxes around uh, one phase. For example, uh, if you look at uh, image C, um, uh, the boy in the white uh, corner, there's uh, several bounding boxes around it. If you would lower the non-maximum suppression value, then you can get rid of these multiple bounding boxes, but as I said, it's actually good to keep them to have um, a better recall. Yeah, finally, the web application. Um, is a very helpful tool then to un better understand and get a feeling of these parameters. You can like turn the sliders and adjust the parameters for a specific uh, task you want to have um, or for a specific uh, video and then you can fine tune these parameters. And for that, um, this application is very helpful. As an outlook, um, yeah, we want to further optimize the ap web application for better multi-user performance. Um, next, we want to make available more complex anonymization filters that use less blurring. If you use less blurring, you um, might keep more social cues intact, like the gaze direction or the head orientation. And uh, but you run into the risk of um, like de-anonymization de of the person. And uh, therefore, maybe um, algorithms like uh, random face morphing might help here. Further, we want to do implement batch processing for videos, and um, we have an open issue, and that open issue is uh, audio anonymization. If you can suggest me a tool, I'm very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting tool, so we can, is it available in, in the Clarion infrastructure um, yet? Or? It will be available in a few weeks. Uh, we need to do, I need to do some code cleanup. Okay, and then, no, no, I can, <laughs> I can understand. Uh, the link is in the paper. Sorry? The link is in the abstract. Okay, very good. Um, and so, if we have a video, we can just upload it and we can download it with the faces blurred. That's that is the final goal. At the moment, the uh, process is only images, but uh, for video processing, there will be an, an offline tool in Python that you can just give a video and then it will uh, anonymize that. Okay, okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, talk. Um, my question is, so how robust is it when, so you mentioned the hands before the phrase and stuff like that, right? So the blurring will be, it will be just everything in the bounding box, or will it be so smart as to just blur out the face, but not a hand? Uh, at the moment, uh, it's the whole bounding box that gets oh. blurred to be on the safe side. Imagine uh, you have like, um, did you miss something important? It might be a special earring or something that might still um, shine through the hand. Yeah, it's yeah. better to blur everything just to keep the yeah. better safe privacy of a, yeah. of, a, of a person. Yeah. So I understand you want to be on the safe side, uh, of course, but doesn't it happen that it is going to blur things that are not faces at all that might blur a crucial picture, a crucial aspect of the picture that uh, is relevant for whatever purpose is used? Yes, that might happen. Um, actually, um, for our corpus, we have a manual annotation step anyway. Of course, automatic um, uh, anonymization helps a lot. So 99% of faces are detected. Uh, still, some faces get missed uh, by the detector. Then you have this uh, manual um, uh, walk through the videos and um, that could also like remove bad bounding boxes that um, blur non-face uh, things. Yeah, unfortunately, these detectors are not perfect, not 100% perfect, yeah. And if you have a manual pass, you can as well, like, remove bonding boxes that are in the wrong place. Yeah, I always have a question with these square or rectangular bounding boxes. Our faces are not necessarily rectangular, or um, is there any progress in the field to move away from rectangular bounding boxes to more, well, I don't know, 
Any, any kind of shape? Uh, yes, there is um, machine learning models that can detect the silhouette of, uh, of a full, hum full human body and also of the face. Um, but I suspect, I have not tested it yet, but I suspect that we are like um, from time to time missing faces. So these models that we tested, um, but it's a guess, uh, I guess that these models are more robust um, regarding um, uh, having less false negatives. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, there's a question. Uh, oh, you can ask a question. We have time. Um, I had the opposite question to Jan's actually. Um, it's not only faces that are the identifying features on people, it could be uh, certain yeah, uh, uh, body characteristics, uh, jewelry, uh, tattoos. Um, how do, you, how do you approach or your community approaches that to identify potentially identifying characteristics other than faces? At the moment, it's the manual annotation step that deals with that. But of course, you could search for um, tattoo detectors. Maybe there is something like that or train your own models. But um, that's not done yet. Uh, so maybe just to top all, all these questions with uh, some difficult issue. Um, we have developed in Klavin, uh, Poland, and um, uh, we call it intelligent anonymizer, an 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 uh, intelligent tool for uh, intelligent anonymization of text, let's say. Uh, it means that we not, uh, not um, uh, remove, not, not, uh, uh, we just ex uh, replace, replace every, every single piece that needs to be anonymized, replace with appropriate uh, um, expression so the text is not destroyed. Can you think about a similar anonymization of, of images? <laughs> there is actually a tool called Deep Privacy. Um, um, that, act, that act, does exactly that. Um, you give it a video and it replaces the human with a totally different one. And um, I showed to our professor and uh, she said that's not suitable because it's um, modifying too much of the cues. The person starts smiling even though the real person is not smiling or the gaze is a little bit different and um, that was not acceptable for that data set. But there is actually um, tools already that are doing exactly that with uh, guns. So it's a possible uh, possible uh, option for the future, just, just if the tool is improved in that moment. We need sure, can... of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Question in the back, Hank. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I'm, I'm doing, I, we develop speech, uh, automatic speech recognition uh, web applications and one of the concerns that people have is what is happening when I upload my file. Um, so especially when you do this anonymization, it typically will be sensitive data because otherwise it wouldn't, wouldn't be a need to, to, to anonymize. Um, so what are your safety protections and, and, how, and do you also mention these on, on your website? So it's a question and perhaps a comment. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, we need to consider that and uh, certainly we want to do uh, delete the data as soon as possible after processing and uh, make sure that uh, it's never be accessible from the outside. But if you have a web application, you always have the issue that it might get hacked. Um, yeah, but best is to keep, to not keep the data for sure, yes. Yeah, so we have these web services and then the question is, is the user, uh, is it the user task to remove it or uh, the, the um, the web host. Uh, no, it should it. be automatically. Yes, I agree yes. with that. I think I think that's the best way because otherwise a web host should be able to access it again, and that that's also. And good. actually, this web application can be run locally. You yeah. can just launch it locally. It's um, based on Python Dash, and uh, you don't need to use a web server for that. Exactly. If you are yeah. So afraid. my 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 advice would be to put this clearly on your website so that people know what what is happening yeah. to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, one last question. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on the challenges in audio anonymization? At first blush, I would have thought that uh, that is not uh, a 
a major problem, dimming the sound, I mean, uh, the speech, human speech is within a narrow uh, range of uh, acoustic uh, signals, so I, I would have thought it, it, it was um, somewhat easier to process than what I now uh, understand uh, from yeah. your presentation. Yes. So what are the issues here? So the first issue is, um, or let me say it, the easy way would be you have a single speaker that is nicely audible, you do speech to text and then text to speech, and then you have anonymized it. But the real situation is you might have, uh, like in a real scenario, might have many voices in a room, you have uh, distracting noises and so on and so on, and then um, even the first step might fail, the, the speech to text, and then you lose information. And um, what I have searched for was not satisfactory. There is some uh, ways of to distort, distort the audio, to add uh, distortion noises and to, to shift the pitch and so on. Um, but uh, it seemed like it is still easy enough to recognize the person. So from what I saw and what I, my, web, my research, um, like a little bit of research I did, uh, it seems to be an open issue to have a, like a non-invertible uh, anonymization that at least keeps the uh, prosody intact and that has not the issues with um, like barely audible persons. Everything needs to be anonymized to be sure. <laughs> 